so thank you. First, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk here today. And as you just heard, I will be talking about massless modes in ADS3 CFT2, with a focus on the symmetries, how you can write down better equations, and a bit about the dressing phases of these modes. And this is work I've been doing lately together with Marco Baggio, Riccardo Borsato, Alessandro Sfondrini, and Bogdan Stefanski and Alessandro Torielli, who you will hear again soon. So this is just a brief outline of my talk. So we'll start by discussing the symmetries of string theory in ADS3, S3, T4. Then I talk about the massive and massless dispersion relations of the modes in, in the near BMM background here. Then I will discuss the Bet equations and how you can write down the spin chain pictures of these asymptotic equations. Then finally I will discuss crossing symmetry and the massless dressing phase. So there are two uh, ADS3 backgrounds that preserve uh, 16 supersymmetries. So there's an ADS3, S3, T4 background, or ADS3, S3, S3, S1. And these are dual to CFTs, 2D CFTs with 4,4 superconformal symmetry, either the small or the large uh, conformal symmetry. So in the first case, the ADS3 background is dual to a deformation of a symmetric N orbifold on T4. In the second case, the dual CFT is much more subtle and still not very well understood. But these background contain both interesting physics and they're interesting just from an integrability point of view. So from a physics point of view, you can, for example, consider BTC black holes, which is just a simple deformation of the background. They are closely related to the D1, D5 system and related to that the instant on moduli space of four-dimensional gauge theories. And they're also interesting because the backgrounds can be supported by either Ramon, Ramon, or Never Schwartz, Never Schwartz, three from flux, or some mixture of the two. And from an integrability point of view, they also give some new features that are not uh, available in the higher dimensional cousins. So for example, they contain the massless modes, which my talk today will focus on. There's also the connection to 2D CFT methods which would be very interesting to understand, so the interplay between integrability and more traditional CFT methods. And for example, the fact that there are several parameters, not only a coupling constant, but also, for example, the uh, flux, so the mixture of Ramon, Ramon, and Never Shorts, Never Shorts flux. But today I will focus on just ADS3, S3, T4, supported by pure Ramon, Ramon flux. So I look at the background, it has 3S3, T4. So the isometries of this background, the super isometries is two copies of the super Lie group PSU 1,1 slash 2, one left and one right. And then there are four U1s, which are just the shifts along the T4 directions. The bosonic subgroup of this is just SO2,2, which is the ADS isometries, SO4, which is the S3 isometries, and the U1s. Now, when we talk about integrability or about world sheet scattering theory, we want to consider not really closed strings, but at first consider strings at, uh, that are defined on a plane. And in this compactification limit, the symmetry is actually enhanced. So instead of a U1 to the 4, you actually also have an SO4 rotational symmetry. In other words, we are really considering, we are thinking about R4 and not T4. So this extra four, I will decompose into two SU2s, which I call SU2 bullet and SU2 circle. These are just the SO4 that rotates the four R4 directions. So what is the PSU112 algebra? So the bosonic subalgebra is just the SU1,1 and an SU2. The SU1,1 is part of the conformal symmetry, and SU2 is the R symmetry. And the Cartan elements, I just refer to this D, the dimension, and J, which is the R symmetry, charge, the R charge. There are eight supercharges 
So four with dimension plus a half, four with dimension minus a half, and they form doublets under the R symmetry, and they also form doublets under the outer automorphism, which is exactly the SU2 bullet, which is part of this R4. Then rotation of, of the R4 in the background. Now, in this algebra, there is a one-half BPS shortening condition on representations, which is just the familiar D equal to J. So the representation satisfying D equal to J will be a short representation. Now, while the isometry algebra is PSU 1, 1 slash 2 square, when we fix, say, uh, uniform light congauge, this symmetry is broken to PSU 1 slash 1 to the 4 which then gets a central extension. So this is the symmetry I will want to talk about next. So I'll start not talking about PSU 1 slash 1 to the 4, but PSU 1 slash 1 square, because it's simpler. So we start with algebra, which is just SU 1 slash 1 square. This is the simplest algebra you can imagine. It just has four supercharges, and they anti-commute to two central charges like this. And here, I have SU1 slash 1 square, so 1 is coming from each, each one, one of these SU1 slash 1 is coming from each copy of PC112, and I call them left and right. Now, we can introduce a central extension of this algebra, where we introduce two more central charges, C and C bar. And these central charges appear in anticommutators of one left and one right supercharge. So in the, before central extending, these two anticommuted, and now we get some non-trivial central charge. And this is the symmetry algebra acting on excitations on the world sheet that are off-shell, which in this case just means that they have some non-zero momentum on the world sheet. So it's useful to combine these central charges, the H left and H right, into the Hamiltonian H, which is just the sum of them, and a U1 charge M, which I'll call the mass, because it will appear as the mass of excitations, which is just the difference of them. Now, in this algebra, there's a quadratic shortening condition. There's, there's two ways to write it. So it's either h left, h right is equal to c square, or in terms of h and m here, it's h square equal to m square plus c c bar. And a short unitary representation of this algebra is parameterized by two parameters, so the mass and the momentum, or where the momentum is related to the central charge C by just e to the i p minus 1 times some normalization constant. Now, so how does the short representation of this algebra look like? So this is the sh uh, shortening condition satisfied by them. So let's say we set momentum to zero. In other words, set the central charge C to zero. Then there are, we just have H left, H right equal to zero. So there are clearly three simple possibilities. Either H right is zero. We call such a representation a left representation. So it's a SU1 slash one doublet under one copy of SU1 slash one. Or the other central charge, H left is zero. And we have a doublet under the other SU2. Or both of them are zero. And then, for zero momentum, we have just two singlets under SU1 slash 1 square. However, we are not really interested in the zero central charge case, but for general central charge, all three of these representations are actually quite similar, and they are, in particular, they're all one plus one dimensional. So when we set C equal to zero, one of them decomposes into two singlets, but in general, they are all one plus one dimensional. And from the shortening condition up here, and the form of the central charge C, and this conjugate C bar, we can right away find the dispersion relation. So it's just a standard form you're all familiar with, just m square root of m square plus h square sine square p over 2, where this h now is an effective coupling constant, which at large coupling is equal to uh, the string tension, but in general receives higher order corrections in a large coupling expansion. At the moment, what is known is that there is no one-loop correction, but presumably a two-loop correction, if I remember correctly. 
Now, the actual symmetry of the, in the ADS3 T4 case is SU1 slash 1 to the 4. But this is simple. It's just two copies of the algebra I just discussed. So you just take two copies of SU1 slash 1 squared. So on the supercharges, now an extra SU2 index. But the central charges of the two copies are identified. So on the right hand side, we just have some delta functions here. Since we just take in tensor products, or we're just adding the two charges, the short representations are now two plus two dimensionals, considering two bosons and two fermions, and they're still parameterized by the same mass and momentum. And the world suit's excitations in light cone gauge now will consist of four short representations of this algebra. So there are two massive representations. You can represent them by a diamond like this. So we call them a left and a right mover because they correspond to the SU1,1 slash 2 left or right algebra. And there are two massless four-dimensional representations. And the two massless representations actually form a doublet under the second SU2 circle, which is an algebra that completely commutes with SU1,1 slash 2 and with the central extended SU1 slash 1 to the 4. So that's the field content of the theory. But let's think a bit more about the dispersion relation. So as I mentioned, from the shortening condition, the, this form of the dispersion relation follows. So it's just m squared plus 4 h squared sine p over 2. And for some positive mass, this is just some sine which is essentially a sign that's uh, shifted up to have some non-zero intercept here. It's clearly periodic in momentum, so it's natural to choose some physical region, say between minus pi and pi, and then identify anything that has a higher momentum with some other uh, choice between uh, minus pi and pi. But it's also clearly continuous when mass goes to zero, so we can just send mass to zero. However, when we actually set mass to zero, firstly we get, instead of this square root, we're left with just 2h times absolute value of sine p over 2. And the dispersion relation just develops a cusp at zero momentum. Now, with this choice of physical region, this cusp sits in the middle of the physical region, which is quite inconvenient. So it's better to shift it over and have the physical region between zero and two pi. Because then the cusp just sits at the end of the dispersion relation. And note that these two points, two pi and zero, are now also identified. So like in ADES5, it's convenient to introduce a different parameterization of this dispersion relation in terms of, in terms of these so-called Tchaikovsky variables. So let me remind you how this has worked in the massive case. So you introduce two complex parameters, which for single physical excitations are complex conjugate, and they satisfy two constraints. So the ratio of the two is just e to the ip, the momentum, and they have this quadratic relation involving the mass of the excitation. So for positive mass, or non-zero mass, x plus and x minus live outside the unit circles. In particular, if I really take real momenta, they live on some, for some particular choice of mass, they live on some line like this. Now, if I send this mass to zero, these lines approach the unit circle. However, note that when I send them to zero, no matter how close to zero the mass is, x plus x minus always go out to infinity when the mass goes to, sorry, when the momentum goes to zero. So they approach the unit circle and then they have a tail which just very fast goes out to infinity. On the other hand, if I really set the mass to zero, I get the same constraint but with a zero on the end here. And it's easy to see that this is solved by simply setting x plus minus equal to e to the plus minus i p over 2. And in particular, this trivially solves this 
constraints by setting x minus equal to 1 over x plus, which is clearly a solution of this. And these parameters just live on the unit circle now. So x plus sits on the upper, unit, upper half of the unit circle, x minus on the lower half. And the difference to the massive case is that when mass goes to zero, no, when momentum goes to zero, x plus and x minus now approach plus minus and one, minus one. So they don't go off to infinity. So let me now discuss a bit about the Bet equation. So first, something you probably all remember. So to find the Bet equations, we first need a two-particle S matrix. And this can be found by just imposing that the S matrix is invariant under this off-shell centrally extended algebra. So you just impose that the symmetry generators all commute with the S matrix, co-commute, I guess. Uh, it's important here that the co-product of these supercharges is non-trivial. So if you do this, you find some solution that automatically satisfies this, the Young-Baxter equation, and it contains four unknown coefficients, the dressing phases. And there are four of these. I denote them by sigma, so bullet, 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 bullet with a tilde, bullet, circle, and circle, circle. So the first one, the bullet represents a massive excitation. The non-tilde one just represents the scattering of two massive excitations of the same type, so left, left, or mass plus one, plus one. The second one is left, right, or mass plus and minus one. Bullet circle is the phase for scattering a massive with a massless excitation. And circle circle is the scattering of two massless excitations. And these four coefficients are not uh, fixed by the symmetry by itself. But of course, there's also a crossing equation which we need to take into account. And this, uh, this puts further constraints of these. And I will discuss in this in the end. But let me first talk a bit about the asymptotic beta equations. So since the scattering matrix is non-diagonal, we need a nesting procedure to find the, S matrix, uh, to find the beta equations. And there's also several representations of scattering. So at first level, we need to pick some set of equations that scatter diagonally. And there's four of those. One, say, say the highest weight state in one of the, each of the four representations. Then we just, in the normal way, impose periodic boundary conditions on some scattering state containing just these four, these four types of excitations. This leads to the first levels of the better equations. Then you can use, act with the supercharges on these excitations to create higher, to create other excitations. And by imposing compatibility with the S matrix, you can find the full set of better equations. Now, the full set of Bet equations is quite long and complicated and doesn't fit on the slide. So I will just give you a graphical representation of the equations. So there are three momentum carrying nodes, meaning one for each type of excitation. So one for the left mover, one for the right mover. These are massive. One of them is of SU2 type, and the other one is of SL2 type. And then there's one node for the massless excitations. And this one is fermionics, so it's just a trivial self-scattering. And the other two are standard SU2 and SL2 forms, are parameterized with three sets of these uh, better roots. Additionally, there are two auxiliary roots, which are called one and three here. And there are various couplings between these. So between this one here of type two and the one and three, there's just a standard coupling of this form. If often it's referred to as a Dinkin link. In the other direction, there is this sort of inverse coupling of this form. And there's also a direct coupling between the massless mode and the <coughs> auxiliary root. And in addition to this, there's also couplings between pairwise all the momentum carrying nodes. And these consist of some uh, rational factors and the four dressing phases here. And if you want to actually see the equations, you have to look in our paper, because I 
couldn't fit them in a slide. Now, this is a quite involved diagram, but let's first discuss the symmetries of it. So, the manifest symmetry is sort of, I show some the representation to, to, so that should be easy to see. So, the manifest symmetry is at first sight PSU112 times SU1,1. So, if I just rotate this diagram a bit, you see here the PSU112 Dinkin diagram, which is made up of these three nodes. However, we can divide the auxiliary roots here in two types the ones that sit outside the unit circles and the one that sit inside the unit circle. And if we take the ones that sit inside the unit circle and just invert them and just give these a new name, we can actually just find two new sets of roots, which are depicted here. And if you do that and insert this in the, in the various couplings in the Bet equations, you get new types of couplings. And the new types of couplings are exactly standard, but coupling to the other momentum, massive momentum carrying route. So with this procedure, we produce the full PSU 1, 1 slash 2 square global symmetry. So there are six massive equations if we just take, take yes, the massive excitation into account. And these were, of course, written down already a couple of years ago. But then there are now the new couplings to this massless root in the middle, which couples essentially to all the other roots, making the full system quite complicated. Now, the full system is quite complicated, as I said, so let's go to a weak coupling limit. So I'm not really talking about the CFT derivation of this, but just let's formally send h to zero and see how the equations simplify. To do this, we need to understand how the various roots scale with h. So, the quadratic constraints satisfied by the massive equations can be solved by an expression of this form. So note that this is age dependent. There's an age here in the nom denominator. On the other hand, as I said, this, the massless excitations are just e to the plus minus i p over two. So they don't, do not depend on age. So this means that when we send age to zero, the scaling is completely different. So for, x, for the massive ones, they go off to infinity. We scale as 1 over h for small h, and we can introduce some new rescaled roots. While for the massless root, it doesn't scale at all, so it just sits wherever it sits. So this clearly, this, if we just take this scaling into account, it simplifies the equations quite a lot, and we are just left with, we, we get rid of all the dressing phase except for the massless self interaction. But we also need to ask what happens to the auxiliary roots. And the answer is that also for these, there are two possible scalings. So e either they scale like the massive roots going off to infinity, or maybe to zero, or they are just fixed. So in the massless limit, we're actually left with nine equations because it's, we have to split the auxiliary roots into two types. So one coupling to only the massive nodes and one coupling only to the massless ones. So we have three sets of almost decoupled equations. Two of them are your standard PSU 1, 1 slash 2 bet equations, which you get from a nearest neighbor spin chain. And then you have these extra three equations describing the massless sector of the theory. There are, however, as we will see in a bit, only almost decoupled. There is still some slight coupling between them. But let me now discuss how these equations can be obtained from a spin chain picture. So it's natural once you have this sort of weakly coupled bet equations to ask, is there a spin chain which reproduce this set of equations? Now, clearly because of this underlying symmetry, PSU 1, 1 slash 2 squared, we expect this spin chain, whatever it is, to have sides that transform in some representation of this group or algebra. And in the massive sector, if you just turn off the massless excitation, we know the answer. So it's just two nearest neighbor PSU 1, 1 slash 2 spin chains that are just a couple, or they're only coupled through the level matching constraint. So here, 
I will be mostly focusing on the representation theory, or if you want, the configuration space of the spin chain. So I will not be so concerned about the dynamics, so the spin chain Hamiltonian, but just ask what sort of spin chain picture could reproduce these better questions. So let me first, to do that, I will go back to this PSU 1,1 slash 2 spin chain and talk about the representation underlying it. So it's a representation which we refer to, to as a half a half, because the highest weight has weight one half and has, has SU2 R charge one half. So it consists of two bosons, which are doublet under the SU2 sitting inside PSU112. And there are two fermions, which are doublets under the SU2 bullet automorphism of the algebra. And then there are all the SL2 descendants of these fields. And of course, you have eight supercharges which go between the excitations. So in this picture, I have drawn a three-dimensional charge lattice, but in a plane. So downwards, we have the SL2 weight. And in the horizontal directions, I plotted both the SU2 R charge and the SU2 automorphism, and how they transform under these. However, we can make rotation in this lattice to better see how the, uh, to get a better understanding of what the representation looks like. So first we can tilt it a bit forward, and then we turn it around a bit. So now I lined it up so that instead the dimension and the R charge sit in this direction and the uh, hypercharge, if you want, the SU2 bullet sits in this direction. And at the moment it looks quite complicated, but remember that only some of the charges commute with the Hamiltonian, which is just D minus J. And the ones that commute with this are just these four supercharges here and the automorphism. And these charges generate exactly part of this centrally extended PSU1 slash 1 to the 4 algebra, plus this extra SU2. The highest weight state here sits by itself, so it preserves this symmetry. So this is a half BPS representation. And, and, the, and we recognize here exactly the four dimensional representation of this algebra, which I was discussing before. Now, the full symmetry is PSU 1, 1 slash 2 square, so we just take two copies of this representation. The highest weight is just the highest weight state in each one, it's half BPS. And then we have, at the next level, 4 plus 4 uh, fundamental excitations. So either we put in the highest weight state on the right and an excited state on the left, and we get a diamond like this, or we do the opposite, we put a BPS state on the left and an excited state on the right. And then we can match this exactly with the Weyerlchitz excitations like this. So this is the structure of the massive spin chain and how the Weyerlchitz excitations fit into it. So we get a spin chain where each side sits in this tensor product representation. The ground state is half BPS, and the excited states are obtained by just replacing some of the states with some other states in the same representations. So, in other words, by lower, acting with lowering operators. Now, in the weak coupling limit, which I was, was discussing before, the two spin chains decouple. Oops. And we are just obtained two completely decoupled massive PSU 1,1 slash 2 spin chains. So that's the massive sector. When we go to massless excitations, things are a bit different. So I said I wasn't going to show the better equations, but here is the self, the, one of the equations at least, so you get to see something. So this is the massless better equations. So the said here are the massless, root, the massless roots, momentum carrying roots. And this is in the weak coupling limits, a lot of interactions have already dropped out. And this contains the normal kinetic term here, some self-interactions which are just the Dresden phase, 
Here is the coupling to the auxiliary massless routes. But then there is a strange coupling here, which is to the, only to the total momentum of, the, of one type of massive routes. Now this looks a bit weird. So then let's look at a tiny bit of the massive equations, namely just the kinetic terms. So, for, so if you want the corresponding left-hand side, if we first start with the right moving excitation, it's just a standard form, x plus over x minus to the power L. On the other hand, the left-hand side has the same thing, x plus over x minus to the power L, but then minus the number of momentum-carrying nodes, massless momentum-carrying nodes, plus the number of auxiliary routes. In other words, the number of sites on the left and the right spin chains are not the same if I have any massless routes. So the number of massive sites is not the same if I have any massless routes. This means that the massless modes are chiral. So we can think about them as just taking out a site in one of these two spin chains, so say the left one. So they are like holes in the massive spin chain. So here I have a massive chain of L sites, and here I have a massive sites chain of L minus one sites, and I interpret this hole here. Oh, it's hard to point here, as the massless excitation. So in terms of beta ansatz, we can then understand the equations as an nested ansatz with an extra level, which is sort of even before the starting point of the standard beta ansatz. And this extra level describes just where these holes sit. So the holes can have some momentum and they have some quantization condition on their momenta. And then I solve some equations to tell me where the holes are. And then I get two spin chains. I get the left one and the right one. And then above, on top of these spin chain, I have just your standard PUC 1.1 slash 2 spin chains. But with the important thing, important property that the two lengths are not the same. So one can then ask if a state with only massless modes would be automatically half BPS, because I have these two spin chains at each side, they have some half BPS representation, or they have just nothing, which is clearly also preserved supersymmetry. But the answer is actually no. So the shortening condition is delta minus j equal to zero. But this only holds if the massless modes doesn't, if the massless mode don't have any momentum, because the massless mode has some non-trivial dispersion relation. So, as I said, the massless roots give hold in one of the PC112 spin chains, and we can actually get a hole in the other one by just also adding some auxiliary roots. So in total, that means, because these roots are fermionic, and there are actually, I forgot to say, but there are two of each, there are in total four fermionic zero modes. So if we just start with the stand, or two PSU112 spin chains of length L, we can act with these four zero modes up to four times, since they're fermionic, and in total we get, starting with the perpendicular uh, chain here, we get 16 BPS states. And this spectrum of BPS states exactly agree with the supergravity spectrum, as calculated by Jan de Boer. Then we can also ask what are the symmetries of these equations. So in the massive sector, this is well known how to work this out. So if we have some solution to the yes, standard massive equations, we can get a new solution by just sending adding an extra root sitting at infinity. And then these extra roots can con be considered the simple roots, uh, simple Lie algebra roots. So at, like acting with a lowering operator. And in total, there are uh, six roots you can add. So these generate exactly PC 1, 1 slash 2. But note that sending x to infinity corresponds to zero momentum. So what we do is we're adding an excitation with zero momentum. So for the massless excitations, we can then ask what happens there if we add a root with zero momentum. So we now have a new type of root. Does this add, generate a new 
type of symmetry. So note that now zero momentum is said equal to one. It's not said going to infinity. And the answer in this case is no. This is not, at least not in the normal way, a symmetry. So it is a symmetry if you start with just a BPS state. There you can just add a zero mode and you get another BPS state. But in general, if I take some generic excited state, I can just not just ask add a fermionic zero mode and get a new state with the, same, with the same energy. So I need to then readjust the momenta of the, excited, of the excitations. And this is quite obvious, really, if you think about this, because acting with the zero mode is just removing a site of the chain. And that changes the, the quantization conditions of the momentum momenta of the chain. So if I had some consistent solution, and just remove a vacuum site, I need to readjust my solution, and it will give a different energy in the end. Or in other words, another way to say this is I have a family of BPS states, as I showed you in the last slide, I have 16 BPS states. So they, of course, all have zero energy, but the spectra, the massive spectra above these 16 states are not necessarily the same. They can be just, they don't have to be related to each other. However, there is a way to get the new symmetry, and that is adding not only a momentum carrying node, a momentum, momentum carrying root at one, but also an auxiliary root. Now we need to be a bit careful because there are couplings where we just become zero over zero here, but you can take a consistent limit and see that this actually does give a new solution. If you give a solution to the better equations, you get a new solution. So the interpretation of this is that there are also four bosonic zero modes. And these are nothing but the four shift symmetries along the directions of T4, or R4, if you want. So that's the picture we have at the moment of the spin chain, which includes now the massless modes. So let me finish by talking a bit also about dressing phases. So as you know, uh, like in ADS5, say, there is a crossing transformation on these x plus x minus variables, which sends x to 1 over x. Now if you write the momentum and energy in terms of x plus and x minus, it's easy to see that if I send x plus and minus to 1 over x plus minus, it takes p to minus p and e to minus e, as expected. However, when we talk about the crossing symmetry, we need to not only know in where we start and where we end, but along which path we want to do this transformation. So in the massive case, the physical excitations sit outside the unit circle. And the dressing phase has branch cuts along the unit circle. So you're both in the upper and the lower half of the unit circle like this. Now we want to go from x plus up here to, x, to 1 over x plus, which sits somewhere here. So how do we do that? Well, one consistent choice is to decide that we cross on the lower half of the unit circle like this. Now, for massless excitation, things are a bit different because they sit on the unit circle. So in this case, instead, the dressing phase has branch cuts not on the unit circle, fortunately, but on the real line instead. So there's one branch cut between plus and minus one here, and one going from plus minus one to infinity. So how do we cross? Well, in this case, the corresponding prescription is to cross outside, uh, outside the unit circle, cross the real line outside the unit circle to go from x plus here to 1 over x plus down here. And similarly, x minus starts down here and it crosses on the outside of the unit circle. So just as a reminder, before I talk about the massless stressing phases, let me 
talk, just remind you quickly about the mass dressing phases. So the mass dressing phases satisfy some complicated equation like this, and they can be expanded at large coupling into the so-called AFS phase, and then there's the Hernandez-Lopez phase, which is the one loop piece, and then there are higher order corrections, which in ADS3 turn out to be the same as in ADS5. So the only difference between ADS5 and ADS3 are these two theta minus here, which come in at one loop order. Now, the only part, part that I will be interested in here is the Hernandez-Lopez phase. So it satisfies the crossing equation of this form and can be satisfied, it can be solved by this type of integral, where this, we have some kernel here and this function g is written here. Well, it's essentially the log here, except we have put in some extra factors to, choose, to get the branch cuts of the logs in a nice form. So the plus minus here just tells us that depending on where we are, we need to do the integral in slightly different ways. So here's one example. We have y plus, we have x minus. There, the, this integral has a branch cut here going off to infinity and the branch cut here going to zero. And we do the integral along the upper half of the unit circle. Now the massless equation satisfies this equation. And note that the right hand here, here, side here is independent of the coupling, because in the massless case, the x's don't depend on h. And this will be discussed in more detail in the next talk. This equation is exactly the same, actually, as the equation for the massive Hernandez-Lopez phase. So naively, you would think it would be solved by the same integral. However, for the massless case, the variables x and y here sit on the unit circle. And then it's not very convenient to do the integral on the unit circle. So instead, we need to deform the integral here. So we, we just shift the contour down, and we need to avoid any poles, of course. So in the end, we obtain an integral along the real line from minus 1 to 1, plus an integral around any poles we encountered on the way. Once we've done that, it's, of course, simple to set x plus and x minus and, and y's onto the unit circle. And since the integral is now between plus and minus 1, the resulting dressing phase has a branch cut on the real line, as we expect. So this solution, this minimal solution, can be expanded in charges in the standard way. So, however, the charges now are just signs, meaning that this expansion is just really a Fourier expansion. And the coefficients are exactly the same as for the standard Hernandez-Lopez phase. However, in the massless case, this sum is actually hard to perform. So one way to compare with, say, perturbation theory is to do a BM, near BMN expansion. So we just take the large coupling limit where, with the momentum scaling as 1 over h. So for massless variables, this just means that the sets are 1 plus minus i p over 2 h. And note that the only dependence on momentum here is in the combination p over h. So if we expand the crossing to the, uh, the solution to the crossing equation, we see that we get some rational part and the log term. The log term is expected because that's exactly what's needed to solve the crossing equation. But the h dependent, the only way it can come in is pq over h square here. And here we also have a p times a q. And that also has to come with an h square because the only h dependence in the whole problem came from this rescaling of the momentum. Sorry. On the other hand, a perturbative calculation by Linus and Pair this year gave the following result. So it's very similar. The prefactor here is the same, except that, of course, they don't get a log of h square in their one loop perturbative result. Now, the difference here is just a homogeneous solution to the crossing equations. So they satisfy exactly the same crossing equation. But it's very hard to, so far we haven't been able to come up with a natural choice. It's easy to just cook up whatever crazy form you want that just 
it's solve, it just gives this difference. You just need some log of 64H square somewhere in it. But to have that in a natural way, I'm not sure where it will come from. So just let me give a summary. So I've been discussing the BET equations for string theory in ADS3, S3, T4. So these are standard PSU 1,1 slash 2 BET equations, but with an extra massless node, which does not really, con in the standard way, uh, correspond to a dinking, dinking node in the diagram. So the BPS, spectrum of BPS states are just generated by four fermionic zero modes and matches the supergravity spectrum. And the massless modes also give an extra, or four extra U1 symmetries, which I interpret as the shift symmetries along T4. So this can be reproduced by spinch and pic picture where the massless modes appear as holes in the massive spin chain. So th this is quite similar to our discussion, or it's a, a, essentially identical to our discussion about a reducible spin chain. So you can think about this not as holes, but a singlet plus some other, some other representation sitting at each side. So you have a reducible representation at each side of the spin chain. And it also, expect, uh, also matches the representation theory obtained from just looking at the fields of the Higgs branch CFT obtained in the, when you flow to the IR on the, of, if, when you flow n equal to two superior meals in two D to the IR. Also to discuss the massless dressing phase. So the only non-trivial crossing equation is at the hernandez lopez order, so one loop. And the minimal solution can be found by just taking the standard on the slope space and deforming the contour so that it makes sense when, with the massless kinematics. Now, there's also mixed mass phase, but it's very closely related to the same uh, construction. There's, of course, still a bunch of open questions. So first one can ask, what is the nature of this extended Dinkin diagram? So I have a PSU 1,1 slash 2 square Dinkin diagram with an extra node. So I can suspect, can suspect there is some relation to the extended small 4,4 superconformal algebra. In particular, this algebra is expected to contain not only the standard superconformal part, but also four extra bosonic and four extra fermionic currents. Then one can, of course, ask about the Hamiltonian of these massless modes. Later today, we will hear about wrapping corrections in involving these massless modes, which are actually quite different from, from the standard case. So see in next talk later. As I mentioned, there are some problems matching with perturbation theory, but there, so this needs to be solved. And finally, we can ask if there is extension to say the mixed flux case or to other backgrounds such as ADS3, S3, S3, S1. So thank you. Yes, if you want. See what? Uh, rotational symmetry. Uh, I, I that's the SO4 that I had. SO4? Yes. So, uh, you have an idea, I mean, any idea how to break the SO4 symmetry so that you would be able to see the No, I mean, it's a, it should be broken by some extra boundary conditions, but at the moment, so when you look at, so you discuss the S matrix, you just look at small fluctuations around some point-like string, and these will, so I don't consider winding modes on the T4, I only consider local fluctuations, and these have, these do see this SO4. Uh, and what do you get if you guys see like one each, and uh, I can see the winding set? A mess. Uh, <laughs> what do you mean a mess? <laughs> I mean, 
I haven't managed to. I haven't managed to make any sense. I mean, you get some Hamiltonian, I suppose, but I can't say much about it. It's more complicated than in you know, AS5 when you have this one. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. They, they do decouple in the decompactification limit. So yeah. Yes. So, but I don't know how to reinsert so that. Why is it so, yeah, so we're taking a scaling limit. If you want, you can think about it taking some scaling limit of the T4. Ah, so <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thanks again.